All right, welcome to No Bucks Given, the podcast where we have honest conversations about the horse industry. Whether we're debunking the science behind common myths or we're tackling and looking at both sides of a social issue, we want to get to the bottom of what matters the most, which is how best to take care of and advocate for our horses. Today I have with me my trainer, Melissa Gallagher, who is a wonderful classical dressage trainer. And today we're going to discuss roll cur and how it happens, how it can be avoided, what it is and what it isn't. And I'm going to pipe in with some anatomical and body work perspective on how incorrect training can negatively impact our horse's well-being. Melissa, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. <laughs> this is so exciting. So I want to go ahead and just ask you a little bit about how you got started with dressage and how you became a trainer. It's a very long history because <laughs> I have been doing this for a very long time. <laughs> so I've been riding about 38 years. And wow. I grew up, yeah, yeah. And I grew up at a lesson barn. So it, I never had a, my own horse until I was in college. And I rode all the school horses, and they were donated. So we got everything, the whole gamut. And um, I learned how to ride all different types of horses and different levels of a soundness also, which right. gave me a lot of insight and experience for what I was going to do later in life. Little did I know. Right. Because I really wanted to just run fast and jump high. Um, and then I did that well into my 20s. And, and then I bought a horse that I still have uh, for a dollar. And he couldn't jump due to former injuries. And so, but I really liked the horse. So I decided to go for it anyway. And he was imported. And how else yeah. was I going to afford a horse like that? Yeah. And so I, uh, I started doing dressage with him. And I was also at the time working for Iron Spring Farm as their jumper. They were convincing me to do more dressage as well. And the rest is history. I really awesome. fell in love with the partnership aspect for me is what really made me fall in love with it. I love that. That's what really attracts me to dressage too. You know, I really love the process of training. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that dressage, um, you know, some people might disagree with me, but I think dressage is much less about showing and a lot more about the actual process of building a relationship with your horse. Um, and it ends up really being like an art form. Yes, and I totally agree. Yeah. And it's, I think especially the way you specifically do it, it is such an art form. You know, your style and one thing I love so much about you is, you know, you don't just focus, you don't just have a very beautiful classical way of training horses. You also are incredibly empathetic with horses in terms of their emotions. And what I've noticed, and I'm sure you can explain it better than I can, but just from an outsider's perspective, you don't just train horses in a way that's fair to them. You constantly check in with the individual horse as you train with them emotionally. And I feel like that maybe sounds a little bit vague, just describing it to people who haven't met you and worked with you. So I was wondering if you could kind of explain that a little <laughs> bit to yeah. people listening to this who haven't met you. Absolutely. I could try. It's Because it is one of those things like uh, that, that can be tricky to just say. And just to just to, just a caveat, it sounds maybe a little bit woo-woo <laughs> talking about it. It's really not. Like, it's really pr quite practical. Right. Like, it's not just some, like... And Hippie. there isn't anything, and there isn't anything wrong with woo woo. I love woo woo. No, I, right, I know. All right. about we're it. we're all about the woo. Exactly. But, but it's a very like you know as and we're not like halting a horse and like reading their end. you know we're <laughs> yeah. not doing that. We're, I'm not we're riding, riding with crystals in my pockets right. yet. Yeah. You know. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> there's I love nothing crystals, wrong with that. Let's but go. like you know, but. It's a very practical, like, as we're training, you know, you'll say to me, oh, he just had an emotional release. I can right. tell that you're being nice and soft with exactly. your hands. And, like, you know, so can you explain a little Absolutely. bit about it's that It's practical to me? application, right? right. So it's not – it is woo-woo and it's a little hippie and it's a little – but I love that. It's getting right. in the field. yeah. But it's super practical and relatable, right. like you said. And I always tell people, if you want to get into this, the best way to start is to just start listening. Don't yeah. do anything different. Just listen to your horse. If you want to get started on this journey that I did, started on 10 years ago, I just started listening more. And you'll open your mind and your relationship with your horse because you're going to start listening to some grunts, to some sneezes. Um, there's a whole scale, which I'm working on. I've got to get this out there. But there's a yeah. whole scale of emotions and, and, and different levels and different horses. And, and it depends on what kind of 
emotional state your horse is in, how much trauma they've experienced, all right? And I relate a lot of this stuff to people. Horses are the same. Some people react differently to traumatic um, instances in their life than others. Some people are just like tough as nails and they're fine with it. Other people, super reactive, right? you know, super emotional, soup, you know. So the same thing can affect different horses very differently. Right. And just like us. And so when you explain it to students like that, just think of it like people. Some people are super reactive. Some people are just always here. But that's not always good either because then you don't know where they're at. She said always here and she oh, motioned. Sorry. <laughs> she some some horses and some people are so much more stoic than right. others. Some horses you know? are very stoic. Yeah. Um and even they have keeled. A poker face. And they have a poker right. face. But that doesn't always help you, you know, to, to know what they're feeling. That can make it harder. Ways. Yeah. Um, but what I like to do is teach horses how to be emotionally healthy in their work. This is very difficult work that's a lot of pressure to be mm. a successful Grand Prix horse. They have to take so much pressure on. They're an elite athlete. They're oh my gosh. Athlete. So you you are not only their physical trainer, you're their sports psychologist. Yes. <gasps> oh my God. Oh my God. Oh okay. <laughs> so we have to help our horses process emotions. Yeah. And in a healthy way, have an outlet for them. Right. Horses have to be taught that, just like people. And, you know, one thing that is really resonating with me as you say this, because even though I'm not a parent and I don't have any kids in my life, I'm somehow on soft parenting TikTok. You know, <laughs> I really do think of horses kind of as giant toddlers, especially in their four and five year old year. You know, they get a little bit older and more developed as they get older. But, you know, I've noticed on, you know, soft parenting TikTok and, you know, the this trend of basically allowing kids to kind of digress and like feel their emotions and then process them in a way that's actually healthy instead of constantly yes. acting out and then, you know, projecting it onto something else and having a tantrum. It really sounds to me like that's kind of the same thing you're yeah. doing to your horses. You know, you're allowing them to have an outlet. You're allowing them to have a safe space right. to process Show them things. where to put those emotions. Exactly. Don't yeah. don't have them, like, bottle, bottle it all it in because then yeah. you get tension and anxiety and mouthing issues and then bucking, rearing, spinning, wheeling, you know, right. leaping, all these other things. But if they learn how to take that stress, process it, and move it out and clear it with releases, all of that goes out the window. There's no more bucking, rearing, spinning, leaping, tension, all of it. Now, this takes time. You know, this is not this is not an easy, oh, here, I'll get a week course on how to teach your horse emotional health and well-being. Well, um, it's just, it sounds, it's just something that you do parallel to yes, the real training. I incorporate of horse. it every day with every horse. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to talk to you more about this. <laughs> um, so Melissa, one thing that really makes me love riding and training with you is how gentle and artful your training process is. And I've always really wondered how you I uh, developed in that, you know, I know kind of in the process of just being a trainer, you develop your own style, but I truly find your style so different from almost anyone else I've ever ridden with. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> like, that really means a lot. Um, it, and it, it's had an evolution in and of its own, right? I um, went down the path of dressage and that dollar horse that I bought had previous injuries and behavioral issues. And luckily- and What I was, was his name? His name is Roscoe. Roscoe. And he's 25 okay. and he's awesome. still going. <laughs> wow, that's amazing yeah, and such I, uh, a testament. He's amazing. Yeah. And so I got him at 10 and he um, uh, was able to not get my silver on him, but I did get to pre-St. George one time with him. <laughs> but I decided at that point um, I was going, he was going to break if I continued. And to me, it's never worth for my goals to risk, you know, injuring that horse beyond being able to come back. So I made the decision uh, to step him down, and he's gotten three or four silver medals for students of mine. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so it's been amazing. Um, or bronze medals, sorry. So he's just been fantastic. But I learned a lot about how to balance a horse that goes unsteadily and can, if you just drop the reins, can look lame. 
Yeah. And if you balance them correctly, they look like a million bucks. Right. And so then I started thinking like, wait a minute, there's something to this. But if I hold them up, then it's going to be manufactured and you're going to see that all through the top line and it's going to affect the hind legs, right? But if I really help him from my core and help his core support himself and have him in the right balance, which is where you come in with all your biomechanic talk, like specifically, uh, then he was able to, to really excel in his career. And then he's a very emotional horse. And so I started hearing some emotions from him. And then I breed my own competition horses, as you know. And so in breeding for 18 years or whatever it's been now uh, and starting these horses, I learned that I really wanted it to be uh, about a bond between horse and rider and not how I was taught to start horses, which is more on the track side of things. And it's get on them in a stall and kind of hope for the best, but it's not safe for horse or rider in my opinion. And, um, and then there's the other way, which is just to kind of buck them out yeah. and hope for the best, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's not the best way for the horse or the rider either, in my opinion. Now, there's a lot of riders that are very skilled at doing that. Um, but for the horses, it, it is anxiety producing, in, in my opinion. And so I started down the path of horsemanship, and, and, but the right horsemanship, learning from people that really do connect um, with that base of empathy and understanding for where the horse is coming from. And then I added in the emotional side of things about 10 years ago and started listening to the horse's communication. Not in a psychic way, just their literal communication, their sneezes, their grunts, um, their left to right head shakes or their up and down head shakes and, and their coughs and, and all of these things and looking at their eyes and their their ears and what their mouths are doing and how their noses are, just all of that started to kind of flood how I was doing things. And all of a sudden it went, I'm not able to continue on going up the levels uh, unless my horses are clear in this area right? and have a healthy and stable emotional and mental well-being as well, and not just the physical aspect. That's and so awesome. I just really dove into that, and now it's become sort of the, the baseline of everything that I do. I'm not interested in going to the top if I don't have those, those things with each horse. That's awesome. And to clarify those things, you mean uh, emotionally sound, mm -hmm. physically sound, balanced yes, horse. Yes, absolutely. And then teaching that to my students, such as yourself, so that they're able to carry that to the current horse and every other horse that they, they ride from then on. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so, you know, you and I have discussed a lot of different, you know, upsetting negative things about the horse industry, but I wanted my first uh, conversation with you to be around roll cur because I think that even if you don't know dressage and you're not a dressage rider, you're aware of roll cur and what roll cur is. And I think that sometimes dressage can get a bad name from roll cur. Yes. Um, so I want to discuss with you what it is and then how we can avoid it as riders. So what would you define it as? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, for me to truly be roll cur, the, her the horse has to be so far behind the vertical that they're nearly touching their chest. Right. Um, and unfortunately, in really bad cases, you will see tongues coming out of the mouth, um, or I often look at the eyes on a horse yeah. that's roll curd, and you can really see almost pain. Right. Um, and Or just also just like a dead eye, like defeat. Um, yeah. And But it's really hyperflexed. The pole is not the highest point, and the nose is not just an inch behind the vertical. It is way behind the vertical. And um, unfortunately, it became a very practiced method almost 20 years ago, really. Um, and it would you'd see a lot of horses like this in the warm-up, and then they'd go into the show ring and pick them up, and all was well, right? Um, but it is really showing a lot of steps that have been skipped and cutting a lot of corners, and um, it's not, obviously, the horse is not able to come back to front if they are going in this way. And so there's a lot of things we can do, um, to prevent it, but it's really given dressage a, an ugly name, um, rightfully so, as it should. Right. Uh, I don't disagree with that at all, and it does 
need to need to be stopped. But um, I think it's important that people truly understand what it is, because a lot of times right. you'll hear a trigger word or a, right. you know a, a hot topic word in social media, and people run with it. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Right. So we really want to understand truly what roll cur is, and not just call. Uh, Slightly, slightly behind the vertical, vertical, a roll curve situation. Right. Um, so. so I, I want to just touch on, you know, roll curve is really bad for horses for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, it's just incredibly uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you are so good at like seeing how a horse is communicating to you. And I've definitely seen horses that are maybe not quite in what like would absolutely be defined as roll curve, but they're very overflexed and they're clearly uncomfortable. They might be opening their mouth and trying to avoid the contact. You know, their ears are typically flicked back. They're incredibly um, just, beh- they're, they're incredibly compressed in the vertebrae of their neck. Um, and, you know, this has not only short term pain um, for the horse, but it has long term, incredibly negative effects on the. Uh, structures of their neck. And I think a lot of people don't realize that um, roll cur and hyperflexation of the neck can cause um, neck arthritis. It can cause a lot of damage to the equine nuchal ligament. Um, and it really stresses the um, bursa of the neck as well. So the bursa are the little sacs that sit between the vertebrae um, of the spinal column. And when roll cur really compresses the neck, it really inflames the bursa as well. And this leads to all these problems. So even if you aren't necessarily doing roll cur on your horse, um, doing a little bit too much hyperflexion can end up with these long-term issues. Um, And I just wanted to you know, touch on the the nuchal ligament um, really quickly. You know, the nuchal ligament, um, are you aware of what it is? You, you know I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the nuchal ligament is so important. For those of you who don't know what it is, it's a, a big piece of connective tissue that runs from the horse's withers um, all the way to the very top of their pole. Um, and it actually skips attaching to the uh, space between the first and second cervical vertebrae. So it attaches um, to the first cervical vertebrae and then the third, fourth, and fifth. And then on most horses, research is showing it's skipping um, the sixth and seventh vertebrae on horses, which therefore makes um, the very top of their head and the very base of their neck. So the very top of their neck and the very base of their neck less stable. Um, So if you actually watch a horse move, if you bend them from side to side, um, you know, either in the tack or with a carrot stretch on the ground, you see that the middle of their neck actually does not bend a whole lot. It's really um, each the either the very top of their neck or the base of their neck. And that's in part because they don't have this big fanning ligament that's attaching to them and stabilizing those vertebrae. And it does do that, right? It has like right. fingers almost. Yeah. So I will definitely, you know, people listening to this podcast, um, when I release this podcast, I'll release graphics awesome. to demonstrate it. So people can kind of picture what I'm talking about. But yeah, so it has two different portions, the funicular and the lamellar portion. Portion. The funicular portion is what attaches like a big cord from the withers to the pole. Okay. The lamellar extends from the funicular and is like this big fan that's reaching fingers down and attaching, yeah, to the vertebrae. And it's very thin and it really spans across these vertebrae. Mm-hmm. But the nuchal ligament helps to reduce the load of the head, which is very big and heavy on a horse. It's around 45 pounds. It reduces the strain on the horse's neck muscles because it basically ties it back to the wither. Um, and however, a lot of it, uh, what it also helps to do is to allow the horse to drop their head and neck and um, not take as much uh, physical effort when they are like, for example, grazing. Um, and 
because it like has these it has these finger attachments that help to stabilize the vertebrae, but it doesn't stabilize the first vertebrae and it doesn't stabilize the couple of vertebrae at the base of the neck. And just a caveat here, they are finding that some horses have more or less attachments. Interesting. Yeah, so it never attaches to the um, space between it never attaches to the space between the first and second vertebrae. Um, it is found to generally not attach to the fifth and sixth and seventh vertebrae, um, but on some horses it does and doesn't. Wow. Depends on the okay. horse and the breed. Is the research that I found, um, which you know these things are always changing right, right. in research. So I like to throw throw that in there. Um, but that's basically why the base of the horse's neck and the very top of the horse's neck is such a problem area. Um, so a lot of the time, what I personally am finding as a body worker is um, even if a horse isn't necessarily being ridden in roll cur, if they're being ridden um, still very behind the vertical and hyperflexed, it still can have some negative long-term effects because that, those portions of the neck are not stable and therefore are not able to protect themselves exactly. as well. Um, and they don't have like this nice soft bend all through the neck. They're just bending at the the areas mm -hmm. of them that are the most weak and therefore they can develop arthritis they can develop you know a nuchal ligament injury Absolutely. um you know etc and it becomes incredibly painful to the horse and as you and i have worked together we've seen uh cases where if the muscle isn't correct right. around that area right it puts extra strain right on that ligament and yes. then you get issues within the ligament but you have to properly develop the muscling in order to take that pressure off and have someone like Maya to right. come and help your horse through that. Yeah, no, we found, um, unfortunately, working on some of, uh, you know, train a uh, training horse of Melissa's, you know, we found horses that were ridden very incorrectly. They kind of get this interesting scar tissue around yes. their nuchal yeah. ligament. And it becomes it basically totally restricts any mobility in the neck mm -hmm. and the sad thing is is that probably that horse was ridden in se pretty severe hyperflexion and that scar tissue was laid down to try to protect the neck right you and know, like it, it could be right. at an early age as well you yeah know? yeah very sad and we did see that on x-ray as well there was wow. some there was some fraying and a little bit of damage there and you know we decided to go ahead Anyway, because right. the horse is amazing, and um, we're going to help her through it. Right. But it's just interesting to note that that, that little bit that we saw on X-ray actually uh, you know, gave us about eight months' worth of, of work to, <laughs> to, to try to help her through that, um, and with Maya's help as well. And, we're, and we're st it's something that we will deal with you know, going forward probably her whole career. So I know we've talked so much about the fact that going behind the vertical is so bad for horses, but I actually just wanted to touch on the fact that it is such a hard problem to fix for so many riders. My heart horse, Wesley, um, he was an off-track thoroughbred that I ended up doing fourth level dressage with. My lifelong struggle with him was the fact that he went so behind the vertical. And if I knew then what I knew now, I absolutely think that he had a lot of pain in his TMJ. And that's part of why I ended up developing my TMJ masterclass because it was a bunch of techniques that really, really helped him. But even, you know, working on his TMJ, getting him um, addressed with, by a really, really good dentist. Um, I had pictures of his neck taken, you know, x-rays of his neck. It was something in his lifetime I was never able to truly fix. Um, and I felt really bad because I had this, you know, I had this understanding of this is really, really bad for him that he's doing that. And I literally, like, there was nothing I felt was in my power with the tools I had at the time to fix it. I mean, because he had no weight in my hand. I mean, there was nothing there when I held him, I'm, when I was holding the reins. Like, it wasn't that I was taking back. I mean, like, my hands were as quiet as possible and just constantly pushing forward. And I, like, could never get him hardly ever to just push and reach into the bit. Um, and I was wondering, like, what advice you would have given to me back then um, and what things you can look at, you know, for riders who are struggling with this issue mm -hmm. to fix it. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a, that's a tough one to say, oh, I could have fixed that, right? Right. You know, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm never going to say, yeah. oh, I'm the, one, I'm the one that could have fixed it for you because I don't know. I, I didn't yeah. know him personally. I didn't see him. Um, 
If you have any videos, I'm happy to take oh, a yeah, look. Oh, yeah, tons of videos. Yeah. Um, because I'm never going to say, like, oh, you needed to do X, Y, Z, and it would have been, you know, a magic fix. That's not always the case, right? We know that. Right. Um, each horse is different, and each issue that they deal with is different. Even if, you know, like you said, one horse might be behind the vertical for one reason. Right. It might be a different reason for another horse. And there could be multiple reasons for each horse. Right. And so each case is, is kind of unique uh, to itself. But the thing that I love is that it led you down a path to help so many other horses in a lot of ways. And that's what I always say about the horses that have been in my past. Yeah. A lot of them. And I'm going to go over the Rainbow Bridge one day and have to apologize to all of these oh horses. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know? So true. Such yeah. a big thing. But yeah. if it weren't for them, right. I wouldn't be who I am. And I wouldn't be the rider I am. I wouldn't be the person that I am. Yes. You know, yeah. it's not just about the riding and the training. It's they've made me a better person. And so I have so much to thank every horse that's come across my path. And some of them I owe apologies to. You know, I didn't know. Yeah. I wasn't taught this way. Right. You know, it's kind of a, a conglomerate of, of everything that I've learned from every trainer I've ever had, but also my own philosophies that I've brought into it and my own psychology degree. And, you know, so that's an important thing to remember. Each horse you have in your past has brought you to the place that you are. And now because you had those issues with him, you made the TMJ such an important part for you and, and focusing so much on the, the musculoskeletal system and Look at how many horses you helped from that. Oh, that's so sweet. You know, that's a that's a really incredible thing that that he did for the world of horses, you know, because you are now there for them. Um, but the frustration of not being able to help him, yeah. you know, that stays with you and that's hard. And I've, I've been in that situation, so I understand. And all you can do is focus on how you can help every other horse you ride in the future, Right. But what I would say to directly answer your question, now that I've gone all the way around, <laughs> um, is all I can do is, and like you said, if you floated the reins and you could never get him to reach, you know, there's things I will try, like adding some, some lateral move. Sometimes if you add a leg yield in while you're asking them to stretch, you'll get that under, you'll get the cross under, which helps okay. them come up in the back more. Okay. You, you basically have to, uh, sometimes Cavaletti's help. Yeah. If they don't, they have to learn how to stretch over the back right. in them, right? Um, I will on the ground for horses that are really stuck in that way, you know, with the work that you do now, helping him release the TMJ. But I will also just physically show a horse how to reach and reward that every time they do okay. on the ground. Yeah. And then try to get it to translate, you know, and I'm sure you tried different bits. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I you had tried so many things, and I mean, I rode with dozens of trainers right. who, I mean, and they said, I mean, I had a D ring Nathan in his mouth right. for most Which of his life. Which is an wife. amazing bit. It's, I mean, it's your grandfather. I mean, there, I don't think there is a softer, and softer bit. Right. And he had a Micklem, um, you know, bridle on him, and then at some point, I did switch to a Micklem. Uh, D ring or egg butt, which he also loved and really enjoyed. But yeah, I mean, I had the softest bit on him. Exactly. And I had so many different trainers try different things with me. And, you know, what a lot of them, what a lot of the time I had to do was tell them to get on. And then right. they suddenly realized, like, oh, there is literally nothing. Right. In my so hand. that's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, if right. a lot of trainers looked at him and you yeah. worked on this for years. I'm not saying yeah. that I had the magic pill for this. Right. I would have loved a shot at yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's, it's, yeah. That's it's what makes me tick. Right. But, you know, another thing I would have probably tried is a bitless or a neck rope. Yeah. Um, you know, just to try to get, if there is a mouth component whatsoever to it at all, right. I'll try to remove that. And yeah, I'd be, you know, the disclaimer about bitless doesn't mean it's always kinder. So you have to be careful with that. You That's know? true. Hackamores aren't always kinder. You have to be very careful with any bitless equipment, just as you would. Um, with a with bridle with a bit. Yeah, uh, just to interject, there it, there are some studies that show that bitless bridles can actually place a lot more pressure on the nose, exactly. the nasal bones, um, and they can place a lot of uneven pressure. You know, so um, I prefer like face. a Bozelle. Okay. Um, it, which is just if you're gonna try something like that, okay. you know, just or yeah. even even those can be kind of harsh across yeah. the nose, right? Yeah, exactly. So I tend to throw a rope halter on. <laughs> and yeah. clip some reins to it. Yeah. So that there's nothing messing with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I don't like the bitless bridles that cross. Un you know, I just think yeah. it's too much. Um, so I prefer a neck rope okay. if you're safe. Um, and you can use a bridle with a neck rope and just see, 
you know, sometimes just using that little half halt on the neck is enough to get them to let go in That's a certain place and reach, right? Yeah. Um, or get that half halt that you might need to to change the 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 way that the skeletal system is coming that way. Um, just a little lift right there, yeah. and it can it can just change the direction of the way that they're going. That's super interesting, and I yeah, I absolutely I love the idea of um, trying a bitless or bridalless situation. I do. One of my best friends is a lawyer. I want to throw in a disclaimer here. Please do not run around the arena <laughs> yes. with. A, please don't listen to this podcast and then run around in the arena Take with your, your horse. Take your bridle off and just go you know, for it. This please, takes, this please takes. do a little bit of like groundwork and research on yeah. how to get your get yourself and your horse set up for that. Um, but yeah, and I think that I love your earlier points of you know, I think that there are some issues in horses that are, you know, they have a past. I got Wesley when he was 11 and I didn't really learn to ride him correctly um, for a long time after that. And I think that, I think sometimes people on the internet and even, you know, people like you and me can forget when we look at someone else's page that they might be very aware of the issue that you see as well. You know, I, like, I hate it in general posting pictures and videos of me and Wesley because he was behind the vertical and he wasn't nose to chest by any means, but he was, he was noticeably behind the vertical. And I just felt so like, I know he shouldn't be like that. I know it it was a very frustrating situation for me because he was the horse I had at the time. You know, I, he, I could not afford a warm blood, um, that was built to go reach into the bridle. Um, and I also didn't have a ton of tools in my toolbox to fix that situation. You know, I hadn't happened across you. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think being a little bit more forgiving of both ourselves, but our fellow riders out there when, you know, we're saying like, I'm trying to do literally everything I can in my power to fix this issue. Right. Um, and I know that it is an issue, but it's also something that is, I mean, going behind the vertical is just an incredibly hard issue to fix. Yes. And that, and I, and I love that you mentioned, you know, we look back and we think if only I had known then what I knew now, I always say Wesley was a victim of every learning cur- curve I had right. as an equestrian. I mean, you know, I had him as a 17 year old who was totally dysregulated and a mess. And he was this incredibly sensitive thoroughbred who was like, Whoa, you know? <laughs> and I think, I mean, I got frustrated with him, you know, right. I, you know, I had, you know, people who told me when I was riding him, he has to be more afraid of you than he is of whatever he's spooking at. You know, I look back and I just think about, like, there are things I did that were incredibly unfair to him. But I also think to myself, because I went through that with him, he – you know, I've had people ask me, like, you're just this very emotionally stable person. And it is because I had to be that for him. Right. Um, you know, he was very sensitive. I had to be his safe place emotionally. And now I can go on and I get to be a safe place for every horse I meet. Right. That and came from him. It right? came from him. And I wish I could just hug him and say, you know, thank you. Like, because now I know better. But also, what if, you know... What if I had posted all those videos on the internet of me riding? You know, now I think so many people would probably attack me. And I wish that maybe we as a community focus less on attacking other riders and more on education. It's really, um, you know, this is something I talk about all the time. The internet is a nasty place. It is a nasty place. And it really needs to change. Where's humanity? Where's empathy? You know, we talk about empathy a lot in this episode in relation to our horses. We also need to have that for each empathy other. For each other, you know, it's harder sometimes to have empathy for humans than horses. I actually, I, yes, I, I agree. <laughs> I've said before. I think one of my flaws is that I'm, I have just stupidly endless amounts of patience for animals and a lot less patience for, <laughs> for humans. People. I think a lot of us <laughs> feel that way, right? With modern dressage, you and I have talked about that they these horses really get like trick trained. Yes, you know, and they're kind of like crammed up in the contact and they're held um, with their hands and they go go behind the vertical and their backs are dropped out and they're pushed and kicked forward. And then they are taught to do tricks like flying lead changes, but they're not through, they're not soft. Right. Um, they're behind the vertical and it does their body a lot of damage. Even like the halt, you know, the right. halt is so, I see it trick trained all the time. Right. You know, you shouldn't really have a true square halt until the horse is ready to have that carrying power. You should not have a training level horse that comes up and halts like a champ. You know, right. that means it's trick trained. It's not, ready to have that strength uh, to support 
coming under in the halt and really having that square halt come from strength, not tricks. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, it's very, very common. And, and I think there's a lot of reasons for it. Sales, competition, pressures from owners, you know, uh, all kinds of reasons in our sport. But I think we need to kind of stop the wheels right, and slow down the, the train and say, this is the training scale and this is how right. it's to be done. And it does take a long time. Yeah. And we have to be okay with that instead of rushing the horses for competition or for sales. Um, it's just not right for them. And the way that we're breeding dressage horses is, is another bit of an issue. Absolutely. In my opinion, being yeah. a breeder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, also. I totally agree with you. Um, yeah. But I think because the sport has gone to such big movement, right? Um, they're kind of going away from following a specific confirmation. And we really need, when we're looking at horses, to... To, and I'll even lend one right. of my photos, if you want, right. of how we look at confirmation right. and, and pick it apart. And when you're breeding a horse, that should be your number one thing. Movement shouldn't right. be the first right. criteria. Right. Confirmation should be the first criteria. Right. And then you, you – because you should be able to make movement. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. That's yeah. part of the training scale. Right. But instead, we're skipping all of that. And we're breeding these horses that come out sort of, uh, you know, uphill as foals, and it looks a little bit weird to me. Yeah. And they're these spider-moving babies. And horses aren't meant to move like that right out of the womb. Exactly. It should be developed in the training. But yeah. we're skipping all of those steps, you know, because we want things fast and we want things easier. Right. But one of the things that dressage is wonderful at teaching us is that you need to have patience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that nothing comes fast. Right. right. <laughs> and we should embrace that more, I think, as a dressage culture. I would love to see everybody slow down a little bit and, and put the horses truly first and get away from spider movers. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with you. Um, one of my good clients who we actually have in common, he told me that you know, nowadays breeders are really breeding to have nice yearlings and two-year-olds, and they're not breeding for a horse that's going to be sound 10 years down the line. And successful, yes. Right. And I, again, I can't, f like, necessarily totally fault them for that because they're prioritizing. Where the market is, right? Yeah. They're, you know, I understand. Like, if I'm going to spend $25,000 on a foal, I'm looking at the foal that moves really nicely right. versus the foal that doesn't move as nicely. Yeah. You know, and that's even knowing what I know now, it would be hard for me to like spend more money on the horse that doesn't move as well right. and just believe you when you say like, no, but this horse is going to be it. sounder. Yeah. Now, yeah. if it can move well and is built well, <laughs> then, <laughs> then you're talking. Then it's a $50,000. Then it's a $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> so true. But yeah. like if we can get both, right? then we're really getting somewhere. But when we're putting confirmation second yeah. to movement, then you're not setting a horse up for long-term success. Right. Right. And that's where he's saying, like, and it's true, you know, even with the, the young horse programs and everything, like, it's yeah. all geared towards how fancy can they be at three, four, and five. Right. I want to focus on how sound they can be at 13, 14, 15. Wow. Oh, my God. Is that a good sound bite? <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. I mean, you know, and you and I have talked about, like, I – you know, I love our sport so much, but then I get frustrated with the fact that, like, not only are there so many external forces such as money and owners and shows, like, pushing us to do incorrect things, but then, you know, even just – the awards that are given, I think, are in some ways inherently problematic. I mean, I think that it would be amazing if we had awards for like 18 and 20 year old horses right. that were still competing sound. And I think, you know, one thing, this is a little bit of an aside, but I've brought up before, you know, giving awards that are special to people who have done the training on their own yes, horses. 100%. You know, I like, I think that it would be so cool to have special bronze, silver, and gold medals for people who are the only people um, that on have that, that horses. Horse. Right. Yeah, record. Because I just think that when you start prioritizing those in a – like basically when 
organizations and other people start celebrating certain attributes like that, they're going to get more attention and people are naturally exactly. going to float to that. And there. then people say, right. oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Or like they right. didn't see it that way. When all right. you look is, you know, who has a a bronze, a silver, a gold, listen, right. anybody can lease a horse and get that. Exactly. Right? Yeah, you're totally right. And yeah. so for someone like myself that breeds my own horses and has brought them along or has bought horses for a dollar or $500 right. yeah. and has been able to do this, there's there's nowhere to look up or to right. see anyone that does stuff like that. Right. Um, and so it, it becomes kind of an unlevel playing field if you don't have the finances to to buy a super fancy horse or right. lease one. Um, and so it would be nice. I think that's an amazing right. thing that we should at least recognize the people that have done it themselves. Exactly. Because it doesn't say, you know, and I'm not trying to talk down right. to Take anyone. Take away from anyone. Yeah, Absolutely. But it, it doesn't say a lot about someone as a trainer exactly. if they've taken a horse that's made up the levels. Absolutely. It does say a lot you know, it does say a lot about them as a rider, you know, that you've done your gold and you're, good. you know, like you've gotten to that level. That's absolutely an accomplishment. Absolutely. But it, I would be much more interested when I'm going to search for a trainer, have they actually brought up multiple horses to right. the level? Because right. that's what really establishes to me in my eyes that they can help me bring my horse up the level. Absolutely. Because there is right. no, there's no set standard for what makes a trainer. There's not in the U.S., which is a problem. Exactly. It's a yeah. problem. Right. Um, and so having said that, you know, like you said, it's not taking away from anyone that has done it a different way. Like I have students that go, listen, I just want to lease the horse and get the medal. Yeah. Cool. Which is fine. I'm like, going to support you, you in exactly. that. And a lot of them are like, you know, 45 or 50. And right. they're like, hey, I have like. I just want like, to do it. And hell yeah. Yes. Hell yeah. But like, if you're a trainer. That's the thing is when you're putting yourself out there as a trainer, when you've only ever ridden made right. horses. That is where I have an issue. That. Yeah. And again, you know, maybe you're a trainer to made horses. Right. You know. Absolutely. And again, if you market and again, yourself that way, right. fantastic. But when that person is, you know, saying like, oh, no, I'm going to, you know, send me your young horse. And, oh, no, you know, come here and take lessons on your young horse. And then it's going badly. Right. You know, but that's, again, that's because that person just does not have that area of expertise. Exactly. And it's it's a totally, to me, the riders and trainers who take their own horses, especially the ones that aren't the most expensive or the most fancy. The ones who take their own horses up the levels are in a totally different class from people who have taken a made horse right. out. Can you take a horse and right. bring the best out of that horse? Yes. You know, can you take a four mover <laughs> yeah. and make it a seven mover? Yeah. Right? Whereas you're competing against people that are coming out with eight and nine movers. Well, and what is frustrating to me is I see people with nine movers who are riding them to be a seven mover, right. and they're scoring better than the person who has a five mover that they're riding to be a six mover. A hundred percent. And that's an inherent in inequality that we can't fix. Right. right? Well, like, they tried, right, with the rider scores. Which is great. Which yeah. is great. But unfortunately, yeah. what I'm seeing with that yeah. is that <laughs> the rider scores are staying right here. Right. Okay. Everyone's getting a everyone's six getting or a seven. everyone's no getting one's, the same score. Yeah. So what is the right. point of having that be the thing that changes riders? Right. When everyone's getting the same score. And judges do not want to give a low rider score. Right. I mean, and I understand. Right. That. And I get it because judges want to be asked back. Right. And judges know a lot of people. You know, you don't get to be a judge without being a pretty established trainer generally. Absolutely. And most of those people know who they're, you know, right. uh, scoring. Sure. It's very hard for a judge to give someone below a six. And so, you know, and I think that they, they had the right idea by trying that, yeah. but it didn't work. Right. So here we are, however many years it is since then. Years run together for me, but it was right. like six years ago or something that they did right. that. Um, so I say, okay, we tried. Right. That wasn't the thing to fix it. Yeah. But I think it should be incorporated in every single movement. Right. I think it should be part of every single score. (laughs) So you're just going to totally rewrite the scoring system. Because if you're not going to step outside the box in the rider scores, where where are we going to change? And I I think I – do I think that 
people will ever do that. Probably not. Right. Right. But I actually think it's you bring a very valid point because dressage is supposed to be about harmony and about balance. And unfortunately, sometimes you watch these riders who are incredibly unbalanced doing their horse a severe disservice. Mm -hmm. But because the horse, that person spent a lot of money on a nice horse, you still have to, as a judge, give a horse, give that box a seven or an eight right and it feels unfair because you're like i do not like this rider i think that they're doing the horse a disservice i think that they need to go back a level or work on the lunge but the horse is the but the horse is good and that's what you're trained to look at as a judge you know in the judges program i did the first part of the l program yes yeah yeah. um did you too yeah Yeah, i did it two or three times (laughs) that's awesome that's really great you know, you're taught to just look at the horse. Right. So I do think that it is worth, like, exploring different options. And, I mean, again, like, I think I do like the idea of having some awards specifically for, like, people who train their own horses because it's focusing on the positive. You know, Absolutely. I think it's a lot easier to just give some people awards for having their own, you know, right. made horse, right. uh, their own horses that they made versus, you know, trying to convince a judge that you should be criticizing a rider yeah. is probably just going to be a lot harder. Well, I think it should but, just be, like you said, right. it should be encompassed. Yeah. It, it should be the whole encompassed picture. Encompassed makes a lot of sense. It should be the whole right. picture. But, you know, this it goes back to what you and I have talked about, you know, before, which is very few professionals want to hold their clients accountable. Yeah. So then, and I'm not trying to, I think it's a great idea. I'm just, you know, kind of no, you're playing holes it down, in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. You know, what if that person gets that score and the trainer just turns around and blames it on the horse? Right. You know, because I've been in the situation, you know, I've had trainers hold my hand and say, oh, no, no, like that wasn't you. Yeah. That was, you know, your and horse. You and I have talked about yeah. this at length. Right? At length. <laughs> at length. And I mean, because I remember working with you and you saying, oh, yeah, you know, your elbows, you know, you overall have like nice hands, but like your elbows do this weird locking thing. And I was like, thank you. I was like, I really like, I was like, I know that they do that weird locking thing. And like people don't talk about it because they're like, oh, you're like a pretty good rider. Right, right. You know, like I don't want to like criticize you and I want you to be happy here. And I'm like, I'm here to learn, you know, that's the thing is I actually think that the, you know, a whole nother layer on top of all this is I actually think people are generally not as fragile as you, as As, you think they are. You know, I think that, um, you know, I've been in a situation with quite a few of my clients who they've asked me, you know, am I the one doing this horse a disservice? And I've said yes. Right. And I think I've had my colleagues say, I can't believe you did that. And I've said, they're my client. And they asked me a question. You're be and I wasn't unkind, but I said, you know, you know, you're not your salad. You know, they asked me, hey, am I the reason my horse's back is sore? Do you really think I should get x rays and look for kissing spine? Right. And I said, you haven't gotten your salad fit. You know, you aren't taking dressage lessons. You're buying your right. horse hollow. Your horse's back they is They need be that honesty from someone. Right. And, you know, th- those people who are asking you, you know, hopefully they ask you with the understanding that your reputation is being honest and right. they're prepared at some exactly. level. I'm never going to yeah. hurt someone's feelings. No, no. But I'm going to be right. honest yeah. and I'm going to make you a better rider. Is yeah. that what you're coming to me for? Right. Don't come to me if you want to be told you're great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we all have work to do. Everybody, right. me too. Yeah. My yeah. favorite trainers are the ones that I've like wanted to cry. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Many because, times when I've left. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I want to be better. Yeah. I want to be thing, better yeah. for my horses. You want to make your horse better. And I want to make my horse better. It's wild that as soon as you start to take more ownership of the way you ride and start to really introspect and think about, like, there are all these things um, – you know, I could improve about myself. It's wild how much your horse suddenly goes better when you take more ownership of your Absolutely. riding. Absolutely. And yeah. you say like, because I just watch, you know, unfortunately some people, you know, I watch them ride and I, and they're getting frustrated and they're, and, and the thing is, is your horse is actually generally 99% of the time doing whatever they think you want. You want. And so probably if your horse is not doing what you want, you're not communicating well to them. Absolutely. Or they're in pain. And you know I talk about that all the time. It's so true. The horse is never going to be the one to change the conversation. Right. They're doing what we're asking them to do, whether we know we're asking that in that way or not. So it's 
our responsibility if things aren't going well, and I see this all the time, and, and I used to be one of that, those people, and I'm not saying right. I never get frustrated. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. But when yeah. you think of it in terms of I need to change this conversation for my horse so that they understand things better, it just – when you think of it that way, it just – brings it from a different perspective instead of, oh, I'm so frustrated with this horse for doing it this way. Well, the horse isn't going to go, you know, Maya or Melissa, I think we should try it this way. Right. They're not going to be the ones to change that. That has to come from us. So instead of getting frustrated about it, we just like take a deep breath or go do something else for a minute or a yeah. day or whatever, right. come back and go, how can I word this? Right. to my horse via my body right. that makes it clear and concise so that my horse is able to understand what I'm asking because they're not trying to do the wrong thing, like you said. Right. And so, but just seeing it from that angle really helped me not get frustrated. I ride so many horses every day and so many different types and babies and trained horses. And I'd be pretty miserable every day if I was like blaming them or this isn't going the way that I want it to, and why isn't why isn't this happening? Right. Okay. Well, it all starts with us. Right. Right. All of it. Yeah. So that's why I'm never going to blame the horse. Which, as we've talked about, a lot of trainers will just say, "It's okay. It's not you. We're going to get you a different horse, or it's the right. horse, or whatever." Right. I'm not that trainer. <laughs> <laughs> so I. But it's cool because I've gotten this awesome collective roots, right, of people right. that have ended up finding this family and appreciating that. Right. And knowing that I'm never going to trash them for it. No. Right? I'm not. Yeah. We're all here to be better riders. Right. But I'm also not going to tell you that it's your horse. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because that's just not the case. We have right. to change the conversation for our horses to understand. Right. Yeah. And we have to just have that responsibility on ourselves, yes. you know, and I think that, you know, I do think there's a time and a place to change horses, sure. right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I know yeah. that that's not, you know, what that's you not were what getting I'm saying. at. Yeah. Right. But I also think that if your trainer is always telling you, you know, you only scored badly because your horse did this, or you only are not progressing because your horse is this, unless they're saying, you know, your horse is physically not able. Absolutely. You know, or your this is just too much mentally for your horse. Right. I think that just saying, you know, your horse is never going to do X or Y, or they're never going to go forward, or they're never going to be sensitive. You have to ride them with a certain aid, or you have to ride them in draw reins because they're just not soft. You know, I think when your trainer is constantly giving you an easy out, that's a bit of a red flag. Yeah, I agree. So to loop all of this a little bit back to Roll Kerr, um, what do you see, you know, first, I guess I want to touch on... What's the difference between roll cur, you know, a horse that is behind the vertical in a way that is unfair to them, and then a horse that's a little bit behind the vertical because they have a balance or strength issue? Because I don't want people to go, you know, in my perspective, I don't think it's productive to the welfare of horses for necessarily people to go through and like go through all the top riders, uh, right. you know, pictures and say, oh, the horse gets an inch behind the vertical here. You know, they're a terrible rider. They're being unfair. I do personally believe a lot of upper level riders are riding their horses too far behind the vertical. Mm-hmm. Um, but is is that rule cur? Is that something we should be addressing? Right. You know, what are your opinions on that? So I do think, uh, and we've talked about this before, but uh, I, I don't think attacking anyone is the right way to approach a problem, unless it's gross abuse. <laughs> right, yeah, right? gross like, abuse, we, we can attack Then go after them. him with full yeah. fury. I yeah. have zero patience for, for that. But um, when it comes to something like behind the vertical, and if it's roll cur to the point where there is like a tongue out of the mouth or that nose is touching the chest, have at it, and it stays yeah. that way. Right. You know, it's one thing, there's a moment, right, and we see so many photos, and there can be moments in time or moments in a test where like, you know, everything falls apart and yeah. there's parts that are just not going to be pretty for a little bit. And it happens. And, and even myself that is so focused on horses being mentally sound and calm and happy, um, moments where the horses are just 
it, it all falls apart and that happens and that has to be part of it. And, it and it happens to me and what I will do is go home and and work on that so that it's better for the next time um, but we all have moments in the ring you yeah. know if it's something that's caught all the time and it is known then yes it is a it is a major problem and for roll Kerr specifically um, there are certain trainers that are known for it uh, and have been for forever and that does need to stop yeah for sure but there are also certain builds you know not every horse has the perfect dressage build right so what i will say is sometimes in a horse's development there are moments in time where it is helpful for the horse to figure out how to lift the the lower back and engage the core there are going to be moments where that horse might dip behind the vertical in order to be reaching for it and reaching for the bit where i have an issue is if the hands are the cause Right. Of that. If the hands right. are coming back towards the rider's body and causing that nose to come behind the vertical, that's where there's an issue. If the horse is slightly behind the vertical, I'm not talking four inches, I'm talking right. an inch. Right. Um, but they are swinging and they are happy and they are, and they are, m the muscles are building in the right way and it's this nice rainbow. Right. Um, the horse might have to go there briefly to learn how to carry that and to learn how to swing through the back as Absolutely. long as it's not coming from the rider. Right. So that's where sometimes it, it might be hard to discern what is a proper moment in training um, versus what's, oh, it's behind the vertical, you know, right. get, kick it out. <laughs> right. Um, I think it. a lot of times I talk about hands constantly, you know that. Right. Hands are a big one for me. I think they're like the, the root of all evil. <laughs> um, and we have to be really, really responsible about our hands and really careful. Right. Um, and if you want, I'll talk about what that means for the yeah. bit right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Maya knows this. I've talked about this. It's really important for me. When I think about my, my training, I want to put myself in that position, okay, as a trainer. If I'm the horse, right, and if I have to carry this bit, and if I have to be kicked in the sides, how does that make me feel? What can I do to be responsible to help my horse not feel like I would not want to feel if I were in that position, right? Having that level of empathy as a rider is something I think that I'm starting to see a shift in in our in our equestrian world, and I want it to just grow by spades because you and you're very big on this as well. Um, empathy with horses is so important. And, but if I just put myself in that position and say, if I had to carry a bit, do you think I want somebody seesawing or floating my teeth with it right. or pulling me around with it? Right. No. Right. No. I want to be invited into contact. So I will never make a horse round and will not see it happen. Right. Um, it has to be an invitation only situation. And so with the young horses, it's all about balance. And I don't take contact in the beginning. They learn how to bend left and right. Right. But not while moving. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So it's they learn how to flex to pressure, yield to pressure. So they're buttery soft left and right. And I will also do a two-rein yield. And they will learn how to flex to that pressure. Horses should learn, just like we want them to move off our leg, they should learn to supple to pressure from anywhere. Okay. Right? It shouldn't create tension. Right. Anywhere. Right? So if you take a three-year-old and you start riding it around the ring with the reins, you're going to create tension immediately. Okay? So I work on teaching that suppleness and that softness at the halt and even from the ground, touching the bit, mm. softening, just... Yeah. What is their response to that? Right. It should be butter soft right from the get-go. And then I get on, and they have to know brakes, and they have to know voice. They have to know brakes right. from my seat, and they have to know voice. I do a lot of voice training because That's I don't awesome. want to pick up the reins. Right. Then, 60 days in, I'll start to touch the reins. But they've already got their core balance without me interfering there. And, yes, it, sometimes it takes my life and my <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I'm not saying this is the easy, safest, easiest route, but if you have this great ground relationship with your horse, you do feel a little bit more secure doing it that way. But then that goes all the way up the levels. Right. Right? If I ever 
feel that I've lost balance or suppleness because I'm pushing to the next level. That's going to happen. Right. That's part right. of it. Yeah, you it's going to get a fail. Li- you got you got to fail yeah. forward. Right? right. And it has to get a little ugly at times. It doesn't it's not always going to be perfect. Right. But when I feel that happening, I know I've got to fix that before I finish. Right. Right? I can't then go up to the next level with the balance like that and the suppleness like that. It's going to get messy and it's going to get ugly and then I got to fix it and I got to make it really good and then we can move forward. And I think there's a lot of pressure from everywhere for people to, they put on themselves right. to move forward. Right. Or they get put on by, if they're a trainer, they get put on by, by clients, or, you know, or, or financial reasons or whatever right. it is. Um, and then it's this, I've got to do it, I've got to do it, I've got to do it. But no, right. your horse has to be supple, soft, and balanced every level. Right. So when you lose it, pushing to the next level, you just have to spend time there and embrace that and then make it really good and then move up. And so that goes for the bit and the and the bend and the roll curve and the moving off the leg for every single thing that you do from three, hopefully to 25 with your horse, because if you ride them in balance, they're going to be sound so much longer. And when you ride dressage the way it's designed to be ridden, which is, you know, dressage in French means training um, and using the training scale. And you have a rhythmical horse, you have a relaxed Mm -hmm. horse, um, you have a supple horse, um, you have a straight horse. You know, when you use all of those components, um, that ends up with a really beautifully fit and balanced athlete that exactly. is much more able to remain sound. You know, I think of dressage as Pilates for horses yeah. because it engages the core and it lengthens the spine and it improves flex- flexibility and strength. Um, and that's what I want it to be. You know, I want dressage to improve the quality of my horse's life. Um, but, you know, so my question to you would be, what advice would you have to someone who feels really stuck with themselves, their horse, their trainer? You know, looking back on myself, you know, I grew up in Iowa without a lot of access to really good trainers. Right. And I often felt like I just didn't quite have the resources. You know, I had one trainer who was um you know, not always teaching the most correct thing, you know, and I think that a lot of people are in the position where they may know that what they're being taught by their trainer isn't correct, but they literally have no other options. options. You know, most people in the world only have in their area one or two trainers to pick from. So what would be your advice to those people who are trying to forge a different path, maybe without very much one-on-one help? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think back to when I was growing up, we, we didn't have the internet. Right. That's how old I am, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there wasn't, there wasn't even a way to get information. Right. Yeah, there wasn't you, even a way to hear this conversation. No, no. Right. So I had to, we had to listen to our trainers that were in our town. There was right. no other option. So we had books. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and I did. I actually utilized those a lot. So... If you seek knowledge in 2023, you can get it. That is so true. And right? I, I love that you mentioned books because that was such a huge resource for me. Right. You know, because there's was, this. It was available. Right. Well, and there's this phrase that is that says, you know, you are the accumulation of the five people that you spend the most time around. But my advice is that you can pick anyone we are we live in an age you can pick whoever you're around via osmosis via books education and social media right. so even if in your town you don't have access to the a classically trained trainer you may have you absolutely have access to amazon or whatever to absolutely. buy books from you know, Charles DeComfy. Right. And, you know, there are many, many really good books that I love. I'm happy to like link in the show notes oh, yeah, and, totally. you know, get your recommendations. But there's so much you can learn about dressage from books. Absolutely. Books yeah. are huge. And, you know, and, and if you don't even have the finances to do that, you can go to the public library and find stuff. Yeah. You know? And they have them. They have yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so now we're in a day and age where we also have social media. 
Right. And so you can literally type anything in that search bar. You can go to TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, all of them, Google, any of them. Right. And you can type in anything. And I would give the advice to people if you're stuck in dressage with your trainer at home, think outside the box sometimes. Yeah. You know, Google some stuff about natural horsemanship. That's where, that's what really branched me out. Um, was was expanding my horizon to not just think about competitive dressage, but to add in this whole nother world of natural horsemanship. And it doesn't have to be that for people. We also do working equitation at our farm, you know, and it's so much fun. And it's and it's a big sport in certain areas. This, it's very new to our area in here. Um, but it adds dressage combined with like super fun obstacles for adults. <laughs> Kids awesome. can do it too if they want, but it's yeah. a very adult Base sport, but it tells you a lot about where your transitions are at, how handy your horse is, you know, and it also brings in things like opening and closing gates. Um, but it's having, functional. It's functional. So yeah. you're taking ranch work, which is fun, yeah. combined with dressage and natural horsemanship. What, what an awesome combination. It's so much yeah. fun, you know? Yeah. And so it doesn't have to be just dressage, dressage, dressage. I think you know, branching out a little bit too and, and Googling or, you know, typing in TikTok search bar, other things. You can learn so much about dressage from other areas of equestrian sport. And I think that's something that's helped me a ton. Bringing, you know, my cowboy trainers, my natural horsemanship trainers, my working equitation people, my classical dressage people. Um, I haven't found a lot of equine emotion specialists. Like, <laughs> I feel like, you know, I'm one of not so many when it comes to that stuff. Um, I actually really think that the world of animal psychology is going to boom in the next yeah, like five I years. Think so too. I think we've we're on the precipice of it. You know, I Hope think that. that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's gonna. I think we're really gonna boom. I like. I wish there was like a way I could directly invest in it. You know, like, right. and that's part of why you know I love working with you because I think that you know your system and like the way you combine practical training with being empathetic and like reading horses' emotions is so unique. But you know, it shouldn't be right. right like, right. It, it's kind of like you know when I take lessons from you, I'm like, that's so simple and beautiful, but like, why has it always had to be more complicated than that? Like, why was I taught to seesaw a horse's mouth? To get it to put its head down. (laughs) Yeah, to get to put its head down and like to sit on them and like drive their back. Why was I taught that? Like, it takes the same amount of effort to ride a horse correctly and you get a much more beautiful result. And it's almost counterproductive to do it the other way. It is. And like, does it occasionally take you longer maybe to bring a horse up the levels? Yes, but you actually get to enjoy the process. You and get to enjoy this beautiful feeling. Yeah. You know, and of, if you take a longer horse. in that yeah. foundational period and right. you really build that, then when you move up the level, when you're moving up the levels, it's then much faster. Right. It's in that beginning. If that foundation is put on very correctly and you really take your time there, you're going to reap the benefits later. Yeah. You know, but un- unfortunately, we get a lot of horses in that have past experiences. Right. right? So we have to take that into consideration. And a lot of times we have to go back in order to go forward. And so luckily I now have people that are with me on that and they're like understanding of that instead of just get this horse and make it go right up the levels right. from where it is. Right. Well, that's not always the best course of action. And it's not even physically possible a lot of the time too. You exactly. Know, you, it's interesting when you watch people come up the levels incredibly quickly on a horse because my understanding is that the level of physical, you know, the physical ability of a horse at Grand Prix is very simple. Is, is the physical ability of a horse at Grand Prix dressage is similar to an Olympic level gymnast. Absolutely. You know, and that gymnast has taken at least probably six years or more to get to where they need to be. And similarly, my understanding is the physical requirement of bringing a horse up the levels without you know, any injury, let's say, yes. is that it has to be at least six years. Right. Like, I just can't from a at m- the very, very minimum. minimum, really, I would argue a lot more like more. eight, yeah. you know, um, or even more. And that's, you Unless know, Unless you if, have a 1% superstar. Right. You and know even I mean? if you do, you know, that 1% superstar, don't you want to be extra careful? You still want to be extra careful and you take know, your time. Yeah, and that's the thing, that's a hard thing too, is, you know, I think, I have some really wonderful professional friends who have this super nice, these super nice horses who they're like, 
oh, I want to push it up the levels. But they're smart enough to be like, this is a horse that's so nice that you want to push them up the levels. And those are the horses you have to be even more yeah, careful with. You have to reel yourself in because, when you get really excited. <laughs> right. Yeah. You have to reel yourself in because those in these horses, you know, to loop back to what you're talking about with breeding, you know, these horses that are bred to give you this amazing feeling at such a young age, it doesn't matter the feeling they're giving you, their skeleton isn't developed. 100%. It, not it, for many years after you start riding them. It's not. You know, their their skeleton isn't fully developed till they're, I think, seven or eight. Right. You know, and so what business do you have pushing them up to an elite level at that age? It's, it's scary. And there's, you know, the developing... The developing uh, Grand Prix and everything. They're right. already doing that at that. And they're just finishing right. their skeletal system. Right. You know? And then the muscular system that has to build on top of that. That takes so much time to build it correctly right. and softly, you know, and with the right engagement and the right impulsion. And to have those muscles be flexing in right. the way that they should. And this is your department, not mine. But right. I do know that... You can't, you shouldn't be doing it quickly. Well, and I like to, I like to use the analogy, um, you know, because first of all, I would just die to see statistics on young event horses, young dressage horses, all those horses who win those, how many of those horses have a career when they're in their late teens. Absolutely. I would love to see the statistics on that. And I know that someone has to, that has to be a possibility. I would love to see the statistics on that. But secondly, you know, when I'm explaining why it's such a bad idea to push a horse too fast, I like to describe, um, training horses as us weightlifting. And so let's say you had a dumbbell that you're holding out like this. The first couple of seconds you're holding a dumbbell, let's say it's even five pounds, it's not even that heavy. You're gonna hold it like this and your musculature is supporting it. Those of you who are listening on the podcast, I'm going to release a video with this so you can see. So let's say you're holding out a dumbbell straight with your wrist and you're holding it out with your forearm. For the first few seconds you're holding that dumbbell, your muscles are physically able to support its weight and they're contracting. However, very quickly, your muscles do not have the strength to support that weight. So what starts to happen is you'll notice your wrist starts over flexing and basically putting a huge amount of strain on the soft tissue ligaments the soft tissue of your wrist. So basically, as your muscles fatigue, all the strain of that weight to continue the movement is placed on the uh, joints. It's placed, mm-hmm. all that pressure is put on the bursa the of the joints, tissues. and it starts to strain the ligaments and tendons. Yes. And that's when we have tendon injuries so in horses. Many, right? And that's also why we have so much arthritis, because we're pushing these horses who don't possibly have the physical strength the to muscling. do what they're asking. Mm-hmm. And so they want to please you. Their ligaments and tendons are taking over. They're compensating. And they suddenly get an injury. And you say, I have no idea where this injury came from. <laughs> Crazy. Well, that injury... Injury was it was started three or three or six months ago, right. and you were pushing them way too hard. Yeah. And you know, so I do think that ninety percent of injuries, and that's a statistics that is made up in my head. That's sure. not a real statistic. Just to be clear, in my uh, you know professional opinion, what I see, it really seems like around 90% of injuries are a result of repetitive strain and imbalance in the horse. Absolutely. And could be prevented. And could be prevented. I think a lot of people, especially in dressage, you know, I think dressage is honestly possibly the worst offender of this. You know, I think a lot of people, their their horse is lame and they blame it on a, you know, suspensory and they say, oh, they must have done it out in the field. Right. Did they? Did they? You know, did they? I, I Probably not. Probably you did it to your horse. Right. And it's not, I'm not saying like, oh, you're a terrible horse person because your horse did a suspensory. You don't realize that you did that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. if you had maybe the first second your, the second your horse started exhibiting signs of pain, if you had backed off and had the vet out instead of pushing them through it, or if you had given your horse longer to go up the levels, or if you had given your horse a few weeks off as a break in the winter. Right. A lot of those things I think would really be avoided. 100% agree. But there's so much pressure on these trainers to like bring that horse right up the level. And there's pressure on these trainers and riders to ride six days a week to right. make money. You know, the horse is what ends up bearing the burden of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Yeah. And I think 
knowing our horses in and out and listening to our horses, right? That goes back to the emotional stuff too. But even just knowing your horse so well that you get on one day and something doesn't feel right, or even their behavior changes a little bit. Right. There's a reason. If you have a mare, it could be, you know, another reason. But (laughs) I love mares. So I love mares. Yeah, Um, they're the best. And so but just being more in tune and more empathetic and more aware of how our horse feels every single day. You know, my, my vet, we, we have a wonderful relationship now. It was very funny in the beginning because I'd call her out, like, something's wrong, or something's wrong. She'd be like, nothing's wrong. Like, she flexes right. clean, well, <laughs> you know. Right. But she got to know that that was, like, two months before we were going to need something. You can feel a lameness before you can see 100%. it. A hundred percent. And I think a lot of us as equestrians are, and women, honestly, are taught to discount our intuition and our feel yes. for things. And, you know, I think especially this happens, I think, I think a lot of vets, you know, will take a trainer seriously like you, but I think a lot of... Tr- I, I have seen a, and experienced a lot of vets who won't take an owner seriously. Sure. You know, they say, oh, that this person's a hypochondriac. Everything's wrong with right. their horse, which I'm sure there vets are vets deal that, with. Right, exactly. Right, like I, <laughs> I'm not exactly. blaming them, right? Like, and if, not- but I have a different background with why I am so passionate about empathy with horses, right? Like because of that, I have a different outlook on it because I'm an orphan and because... Horses saved me. And, you know, like there's this. We have to talk about this. I can't believe you just dropped that an hour and 15 minutes into this episode. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am, I'll come back. I'm holding your ransom. You're coming back. <laughs> 100%. I'm, I'm holding your dog's ransom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. I, yeah. I'm, you know, it's not something that I talk about, you know. Yeah. Um, so when you ask how I got into it. Right. Th- that's not what comes out first. That's fair. Because well, we're, it's we're your taught, history taught, and it's yeah. like deep, you know, it and is. it's and it's raw and it's real. And so you learn how to compensate by keeping that stuff hidden. Do you know I, what I mean? I think I know exactly what you mean. Um, you know, I think those of us who have gone through incredibly hard things have learned to put things on a shelf right. and put them away. Right. You know, I, there have been some very bad things that happened to me as a kid. Um, you know, I was molested. And I think that, you know, I learned to just put things on a we box. We don't talk about it. Yeah. Right. You don't You don't talk. I mean, you I never talked down. to my parents about it. Right. right. And, you know, so I think, but the interesting thing is, you know, your struggle and your background is your power. It's you know? what has brought me to this place. Right. You're so right. I have to embrace it and talk right. about it and get other people that have been right. through what you've been through and what I've been through to give them hope and give right. them power. Right. I mean, I was, as a teenager, suicidal. Right. You know, yeah, I was my, hospitalized. I was well. yeah. yeah. And horses are the only reason I'm the still The only here. reason I'm still here. Yeah. I mean, I have, you know, people who knew me back then have... Are still, we're, you know, we're still friends, and they reached out, and they were, you know, they said they were like, I was really, I didn't know if you were going to make it out right. of your teenage years. You know, they were like, you had it rough, you know, you were doing rough, and they were like, I can't believe that you've turned your life around. And I think that a lot of people look at me and they say like, oh, there's this 25 year old who has this following and has a house, mm-hmm. and like, and I, and the thing is, is I only have what I have because of horses. Right. So, of course, my life mission is to give back is to them. to give them. back to them. That's yeah. Exactly, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so when you come from that background and that mindset, it gives us a, a, just a totally different outlook on on the horse yeah, and what its purpose is in our world, right? It's not just to make money. Right. We are giving back to them for what they've given to us. So that makes us a little bit different. But we can spread that word to people that – haven't had trauma to the degree right. that we have had. Right. You don't have to have had have... trauma to be empathetic. No, it, no. Just, <laughs> it just is. Or to appreciate horses. Exactly. But right. it, it, it's what gave us sort of a, a, a more introspective look at it. And I think. It's like what makes yeah. comedians funny, you know? Oh, yeah, 100%. There's yeah. trauma, right? <laughs> Every good comedian has been through, like, the I'm... worst. So. I could talk to you all day, but I want to, you know, kind of ask you my final question. If there was one thing that you could wave a wand and change about the horse world, 
what would it be? I know you. And okay, you know what? It don't pick just one thing because all of us would pick a lot of things, but just like one of the many things you could change because you're going to be back on this podcast a lot, so you're going to have more opportunities. <laughs> just to answer so don't, this question. Yeah, don't put too much pressure on yourself. And you know what? Honestly, I think I'm going to go with that. I think I'm going to yeah. say pressure. Oh. Pre- God, we could just have so many. That's amazing. Okay, pressure. So pressure. less pressure on horses, less, less pressure, pressure on, on people. Pressure. Horses are supposed to be fun. This is be fun. Even for it's trainers, to be fun. even if this is yeah. your business. Yeah. This is my job. Right. If it's not fun for me, my horses aren't going to have fun. Yeah. You know, and you know I'm big on that and my the energy in my barn. You know. You're so big on that. I mean, I think I didn't even I have to be honest with you, I was so burned out on horses and riding, and I don't think I even really wanted a horse again until I started working with you. <laughs> and I was just like, this is the way I've always wanted to ride. And this is fun because it's what dressage is, which like gives you this addicting, incredible feeling of like having a partnership with yes. a horse that feels good. It's supposed to feel good. It's supposed to feel good. And that's crazy because I've spent so much of my life being miserable when I've right. ridden a horse right. and making them miserable and because so I didn't know any better. Feel like that. Right. And they don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to end it on that. But I would just like to shamelessly plug Melissa because she's the best. She's not good at promoting herself. But she does <laughs> no, have <she's> <laughs> she does have an um, online course that actually I star in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is on her Instagram. I'll tag all of her socials um, in the podcast notes as well as on my social media. I'd love for you guys to check her out. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you. I'm grateful to you because you are very good at this whole <laughs> world. And I am older and I am not. And, um, and I truly appreciate your support. Um, in my business as well and and just your mindset and your help physically helping our horses as well so I appreciate it absolutely <laughs> thanks